We are so glad that you're with us today. My name is George Menden. We have almost everyone through the line, but we've got some introductory, um, some introductory things, and, uh, and we will invite them to continue through the line and, uh, and, and proceed to lunch. Thank you for joining us. We're, many of you have finished, uh, finished eating, but we're glad, we're really glad to have you with us. We love these presentations. It's a marvelous opportunity for us to reconnect with our friends. Some of you we haven't seen for a long time. Many of you we haven't seen for 10 years. <laughs> we have a 10-year tax act that has just expired, so this is a great opportunity for us to get together again. <laughs> As is our custom with these presentations, we often begin with a pop quiz. We are going to do that again now. It's, uh, it's become a tradition. We have found our clients to be uniformly brilliant. We'll see how this group is. We have, um, we have gifts for correct answers. We have uh, hand sanitizer, suitable for travel. We have a calculator so that you can calculate uh, the rising cost of airfare. And we have luggage tags, Menden, Freiman, and Zittrain luggage tags. All right, let's see, how, uh, let's see how you do. The first question, the first flight attendants in 1930 were required to be A, unmarried females, B, weigh less than 115 pounds, C, nurses, D, all of the above. Oh, this is gonna to be tough for us, Dina. Pick two correct answers and, uh, and, and you can help us. The correct answer is D, all of the above. And you're not going to be able to tell the, uh, the, the slide gradations aren't going to be as visible. So, uh, but we'll see if you do as well. Interesting that they had to be nurses in, in 1930. All right, second question. Why are lights turned off during takeoff and landing? A, so the pilot can see where he's going. B, to surprise people in the lavatory. C, to get children overly excited and ready for the flight. D, so eyes can adjust to lower levels of light. The correct answer is D. You're, you're, proving to be just as, uh, as great as our other audiences. Interestingly, there have been studies performed, and if uh, in, the, in the event of an emergency, passengers are able to exit the plane more efficiently if their eyes have adjusted to the light. So the correct answer is D. All right, number three. To save $40,000 in 1987, what did American Airlines do? A, purchase cheaper pretzels. B, make the lavatory smaller. They probably did that too. C, removed one olive from each salad served in first class. C. The, the correct answer is C. They were one olive, 40,000 bucks. Crazy world. All right, number four. How long is the shortest scheduled airline flight? Two minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or 18 minutes? Let's hear it. We've not heard the correct answer yet. The correct answer is actually two minutes. The shortest scheduled airline flight is two minutes from a Scottish island called Westray to its neighbor island, Papa Westray. Westray. Two minutes. I don't know how they do it. I looked yesterday to see what the fare was on Expedia, not listed. So I, I can't tell you what type of flight it is, but you can't buy it through Expedia. Who, who can ensure the new tax laws don't take you on a short trip to nowhere? <laughs> Sully Sullenberger, Ted Stryker, the pilot in uh, an airplane, or Menden, Fryman, and Zittrain. Excellent. Okay, Restina, why don't you distribute the rest of, the, uh, of those great items? We're grateful that you're with us. Thank you for, for being here. Let us introduce you to our firm. Since many of you have been here before, I want to, uh, I want to let you in on a little secret. When you see our curriculum vitae here, there are two boxes. The top box describes where we went to school. If there are Latin or Latin uh, derivatives, it, it means we received awards in school. The bottom box identifies uh, peer review ratings and awards that we have received. Um, we're particularly interested and proud of these. An AV rating from Martindale Hubble uh, is the highest rating available both in, in professional uh, competence and also ethics. Uh, the partners in our firm have all been selected members of Georgia Trend Magazine's Legal Elite for a number of years. Uh, all of the partners and our two senior associates are super lawyers. That's the designation that we're particularly fond of. 
and, uh, and I've also received a Wealth Manager five-star recognition. So, so we're going to go through in, uh, uh, in a little bit faster pace the, the uh, designations that the attorneys in our, in our firm have received. And because we are in a new era of social media, I have scoured the web to find pictures so that you can see what the partners in the firm looked like in high school or in college. And they haven't even seen these pictures. The, so if you want to see what someone looked like in college that is a, 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 a well-educated and highly esteemed lawyer, this is what you found. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, we're going to move by that one pretty quickly. And we're going to go right to Larry. My partner Larry is a, uh, received his law degree and MBA, a joint uh, program from the University of Florida. If you see an alma mater and want to hum the fight song or, uh, or sing it at, uh, at a low voice, that would be just fine. Uh, Larry is also high re highly regarded and recognized by his peers, but I know you're most interested in seeing what he looked like in high school. <laughs> this is what Larry looked like in high school. and. I apologize for that. Jeff Zittrin. Jeff uh, went to the Wharton School of Business undergrad, Emory Law School, also highly regarded and recognized by his peers. Uh, Jeff is a great lawyer. Jeff was more interested in animal rescues when he was in college than in studying. <laughs> Apparently had a pet cat. <laughs> Janet Fortune. Uh, Emory Law School graduate uh, with advanced uh, studies in counseling psychology, also highly regarded and recognized by her peers. We're very proud of Janet. Janet looked like this when she was in high school. <laughs> we all would have liked to have hung with Janet when she was in high school. And it's fascinating that Miley Cyrus bears a striking resemblance to Janet when she was in, when she was in high school. We have two associates, and I would be in big trouble if I, if I retrieved their pictures from, uh, uh, from the social media. Megan Richards, uh, who is an associate attorney. Megan has an LLM in tax. That's an advanced tax degree from the University of San Diego School of Law. She is also one of Georgia's super lawyer rising stars. Kyle McGee was a UGA undergrad where he was a member of the All-SEC academic team. Uh, a SUNY New York uh, Buffalo law grad, and also a Georgia super lawyer rising star. Our newest associate is Amanda Clear. Amanda's uh, meeting with a photographer this Friday. So we borrowed <laughs> Janet's picture from high school. Amanda's a Syracuse University law alum and, uh, and a, a member of the Atlanta Volunteer Lawyers Foundation. Amanda's a great lawyer. We're, we're pleased to have her with us. Now, those of you who have, have worked with us know that, that our office would not, uh, would not function without our extremely uh, capable paralegals, Ann Gehring, who is a senior trust in the state's paralegal, and Christina Allen, who is a paralegal in our business practice. But the office really runs as a result of Rustina McDaniel, Joan A. House, Tina Belden, Amanda Prescott, Robin Johnson, and Alan Fryman. Without them, we wouldn't be here, and nothing would get done, so we appreciate them. Uh, we really appreciate them. Larry, clap for, uh, uh, for these great people on our staff because my hands are full. It's my pleasure to offer the Circular 230 disclosure. This presentation can't be used to avoid tax penalties, nor for purposes of promoting, marketing, or recommending to another party an arrangement involving any tax-related matter addressed in this presentation. We love to address your matters individually, but, uh, but it is unethical to take things that we may say and apply them broadly to your situation. So let us meet with you and talk about, uh, about your specific situation. As you know, we have two practice areas in our firm. We have an estate and trust practice, which involves the, the preparation of wills, trusts, and estate planning, charitable foundations and trusts, tax planning, asset protection planning, advanced wealth transfer techniques, which we will be speaking about today probate, trust, and estate administration, and a business practice, which includes a general representation of closely held businesses, succession planning, tax planning, and merger and acquisition work. It's our pleasure to work with you. We see friends here that we have done all of these things for, and we're glad that you're with us. Okay, we're going to begin. Um, 
Larry and I are going to, to speak to you today. I'm going to take the clock back and describe where we have come from, and then Larry is going to talk about this new Tax Reform Act of 2010 and its effect on you and, uh, and your clients. Let's start by turning the clock back. In 1977, the estate and gift system were unified. We had separate tax systems for estates and gifts, separate tax rates that applied to estates and gifts. In 1977, the two tax systems were brought back together, and a single system was created. The top estate tax rate was 55%. There was a surtax that applied to estates that were large enough, giving us a top estate tax rate of 60% in 1977. The 55% tax rate survived for decades. In addition, there was another transfer tax in 1986, the generation skipping transfer tax that we have spoken to many of you about. This is a tax that applies when there is a transfer of property from parents to grandchildren effectively, skipping the, the generation of the children. When those transfers exceed an exclusion amount defined in the law, there is a second tax which applies at a rate equal to the estate tax rate. Heading into 2001, based on a law that was passed during the Clinton administration, we had a unified gift and estate tax exemption to $675,000. How many of you remember the good old days of $675,000 exemptions? We planned for, uh, for many of you during that, uh, during that era, era. It was scheduled to increase to $1 million by 2006. The maximum estate, gift, and GST tax rate was 55%, heading into 2001. So we went from a 37% estate tax rate. Uh, you remember we had a, grade, a, a, a graded estate tax rate that at $675,000 began at 37% and went up to 55%. The exemption amount from 675 over to a million dollars in 2006 with a GST tax of 55% for transfers over a million sixty thousand dollars. Okay, now let's let's look back to 2001. We had a new president. It was the beginning of the George W. Bush administration. We had a projected budget surplus of $5.6 trillion, projected over 10 years. That's the way the U.S. government budgets. 10-year surplus, uh, $5.6 trillion. $2.5 trillion was dedicated to the lockbox. Remember the Social Security lockbox that we heard about in 2001? $1.6 trillion of the surplus was earmarked for tax for tax benefits, for tax cuts. On June 7, 2001, President Bush signed into law the Economic Growth and Tax Relief Reconciliation Act of 2001. We've called it for years the, tax, the 2001 Tax Act, also called EGTERA. I'll refer to it as EGTERA so that we don't confuse that law with the new law that passed uh, in December 2010. EGTERA lowered the maximum estate and GST tax from 55% to 45%. The exemption amount increased to $3.5 million. By 2009, we had a $3.5 million exemption amount. In 2010, the federal estate tax and the generation skipping transfer tax were completely eliminated for one year. In 2010, Egterra replaced the estate tax and GST tax with a modified carryover basis system. This, um, uh, we, we have spoken to many of you about this, this this system, which is very complicated, rather than receiving a basis step up as a result of, a, of, a, of assets passing through an estate, the heirs receive those assets at a carryover basis with, uh, subject to a couple of, uh, a couple of step ups, there, there is a $1.3 million exemption for family members, non-spouse family members, and a $3 million exemption for family members. Although there was no estate tax imposed on 2010, uh, 2010 deaths under Egtera, this carryover basis regime substituted, and in some cases, actually substituted a capital gain tax. So a capital gain tax was being substituted for an estate tax. Is a capital gain tax better than, a, better than an estate tax? Of course, it's always better than an estate tax. The, for 2010 estates, under this regime, many people were going to be required to file estate tax returns that, ha that had not been required to file them before. If you look at the estate taxes that would have been required, the estate tax returns that would have been required with a $3.5 million exemption amount, which we had in 2009, and project that forward, 
As a result of this basis carryover and the need to assign basis, eight or nine times as many returns were expected in 2010. Now, interestingly, that number was only projected to be about $60,000. That's how many people had been removed from the estate tax system as a result of a $3.5 million exemption amount. Okay, the, I'm going to put the last slide up for just a moment and talk a little bit more about Egterra. As a result of a, of a Senate rule, it's, uh, it's referred to as the Bird Rule, tax legislation which is not revenue neutral over a 10-year period automatically expires. So when this law was passed, we knew that it would sunset in 2011. 2010 was a repeal year, 2011. We, we returned to the system that would have existed had this law not been passed. A $1 million estate exclusion amount, a $1 million gift exclusion, and the GST tax amount had been indexed for inflation, so it was at $1.06 million. Everyone in our profession thought Congress would fix this mess. We never thought we would get to 2010 with, without having the law changed. This repeal year is very disruptive and very difficult, uh, particularly the, the basis carryover rules are extremely difficult to apply. In late 2009 and early 2010, there were many failed efforts to fix this law. In early 2010, Senator Max Baucus, chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, said, Swift action is necessary to prevent massive, massive confusion in the area of estate taxes. But Congress didn't act. A lot of the oxygen was taken by health care reform. Congress was unable to do anything, and we didn't, uh, nothing was done to, this, to help this law. Many in Congress were expressing the desire to, in 2010 to, to effect change which, which would be retroactive. And then a couple of billionaires died. We lost, who did we lose in 2010? Who's a Yankee fan, right? We lost Steinbrenner, and in Texas we lost Duncan, Duncan right. The, uh, and, and those two families, because of the size of, sizes of the estate, are particularly interested in a no estate tax regime. They'll take a carryover basis, uh, if they, as long as they don't have to pay an estate tax. So it was assumed that, that there would be court cases for years by the heirs of those two estates, that, that appeals would go to the Supreme Court, and we wouldn't have finality in the estate tax arena for many, many, many years. In November 2010, we had midterm con congressional elections, and we had a complete overhaul of Congress. On December 6, 2010, an unexpected agreement was reached between President Obama and the Republican Senate leaders. President Obama agreed to extend Bush income tax rates for two years for all Americans, not just middle Americans, who, who earn less than $200,000 individually or $250,000 as a married couple. Now, who in this room loves the fact that the Bush income tax rates have been extended at least two years? All of us should. I mean, that big deal for everybody in this room. What was the trade-off? Do you remember what the trade-off was for middle income tax relief or for upper income tax relief? The extension of unemployment benefits, that's exactly right. That, had, that carried such weight with the Democratic uh, congressmen and senators that they were able to pass an estate tax bill. The estate tax provisions just about submarined that, uh, that legislation. On December 17, 2010, President Obama signed the Tax Relief Unemployment Insurance Reauthorization and Job Creation Act of 2010. That was the short title. House Democrats were interested in, in a, a more modest $3.5 million exemption amount. You're aware, and Larry will talk about this, that the exemption amount under this new law is much higher. They were also interested in a 45% estate tax rate. The estate tax rate actually has been, has been lowered, uh, and Larry will talk about that as well. The 2010 Tax Act generous provisions regarding the estate tax almost didn't pass until they became tied to the, unemployment, the extension of unemployment benefits for working class Americans. That's the history, that's what's got us here, and now Larry is going to talk about the 2010 Act. Thanks, George. Good afternoon, everybody. Everybody ready to dig in now? And enough fun for the day. Let's learn about this new, uh, this new law that we have. Yes. At, at the highest levels, kind of starting from, from the very top, the transfer tax provisions of the new tax law include a reinstatement of the estate tax 
and the generation skipping transfer tax for 2010 for last calendar year. At higher exemption amounts, however, from 2010 through 2012, lower transfer tax rates, a new concept entirely, which we've, in our profession, uh, have been calling portability. We're going to talk about that. A unique opportunity for executors to opt out of the estate tax for deaths during the uh, 2010 calendar year. For the next two years, 2011 and 2012, the gift, estate, and generation skipping transfer tax, uh, the exemptions are once again unified for the uh, gift and estate tax, with exemptions set at $5 million and the tax rate at 35%, highest marginal tax rate, 35%. The $5 million exclusion for gift, estate, and generation skipping transfer purposes over the next couple of years is actually indexed for inflation, a concept that it rarely makes its way into the tax law. It makes a lot of sense and it made its way into this tax law. That begins in 2012. An important theme to remember in all of the discussion though about the new tax law is that all the changes are effective for less than 23 months from this point forward. On January 1, 2013, here we go again. If Congress doesn't act again, the law expires. Gift to state and generation skipping exemptions once again. You, want, you wondered why George went through all this history? We, we revert back to the pre-2001 Tax Act laws. One million dollars of exemption. And the top rate will be 55 percent once again for estate and gift tax purposes. So let's talk a little bit about the particulars under this new law. Once again, repeal of the estate tax was short-lived here, just as it was the three other times in the century-old history of the estate tax. <coughs> Federal estate tax has been reinstated for 2010, and it's been reinstated retroactively with a $5 million exemption, a 35% estate tax rate, and the concept that there'll be a full adjustment to tax basis at the time of death as had traditionally been the case. This notion of a step up in tax basis was reinstated for 2010 estates. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Again, the general presumption on the, under the new law is that the estate tax applies to all estates for 2010. Congress did not tinker at all with the gift tax for last year, much to, to the dismay of, of some affluent individuals who went ahead and paid gift taxes last year. They didn't get the benefit of a higher exemption last year like the estates did. The gift tax exemption for 2010 remained at one million with a 35 percent tax rate. Now how did Congress get away with this? George mentioned the couple of billionaires that died in this, uh, this risk of litigation uh, constitutionality with a retroactive application of the estate tax. Well, Congress actually was pretty clever about it. What they did is they provided an opt-out election for executors of estates for those who died in 2010. Those executors have the ability to opt out of the estate tax and instead apply what would have been the case in the, in the year of repeal under the old tax law. Now there's a downside for a, an executor of a 2010 estate to opt out of the estate tax. And just to review a little bit of what George had, had mentioned, without the estate tax, an estate for last year, 2010, would be subject to this notion of modified carryover basis. This means that the heirs don't receive the traditional date of death value step up in the basis of their assets. Instead, there is an, an unlimited step down in basis for lost assets and a limited step up for $1.3 million worth of, of uh, basis for all heirs and a $3 million uh, step up uh, or, or uh, basis adjustment for uh, transfers made to a spouse in 2010 where there's no estate tax applicable. So for, with really large estates for last year, with lots of appreciated assets, think George Steinbrenner, that category, there's a latent cost associated with this election out of the estate tax, which will have to be weighed in those cases against the benefit of, of, of not having to pay estate tax. So again, one must affirmatively elect out of estate tax for last year. 
if the circumstances warrant a modified carryover basis. And with the modified carryover basis regime, there's still this notion of, of an inheritance tax, if you will, but its form is in the removal of the step up in basis, the increase in cost basis in assets beyond a certain level. So upon the ultimate sale of assets in an estate like, let's say, George Steinbrenner's estate, if they opt out of the estate tax, when assets in the estate, the New York Yankees, are sold at some point in the future, at that point, there could very well be a large capital gain or large gain to pay uh, on the amount over the basis of that, of that asset. <coughs> So as previously, previously stated, the law permits the uh, executor to assign up to a million three in basis increase, uh, not to exceed the fair value of an asset, for specific assets for 2010 decedents. That amount may be increased further by built-in losses and, and loss carryovers, and the law also generally, generally permits the uh, executor to assign up to three million to spouses. So I've reviewed these concepts in two or three different ways. It applies in limited cases where there's a, uh, an opt-out. Now, the new law is complicated and presents both opportunities and challenges to estates and heirs uh, for 2010 deaths. Now, Congress did realize that the 11th hour, George mentioned, mentioned the date of enactment of this law was December 17th. The mad scramble was on the last two weeks of the year. That that 11th hour change could present hardship if they didn't provide <coughs> adequate time for taxpayers to process this new law and to deliberate on its implications. So what Congress did as part of this law is they provided an additional nine months after the law's enactment date, which uh, would take that out to September 19th of, of this coming year because the 17th falls on a Saturday in September. So Monday the 19th of September is the extended date for an executor to, executor to file an estate tax return for an estate from last year where that uh, death occurred before December 17th. That also is, is, is extra time even to pay estate taxes. If an estate is so large that estate taxes are paid, that they wouldn't have to be paid until September 19th. Congress also thought about how pushing, uh, how this late, uh, late in the year law might affect heirs in 2010, uh, beneficiaries in 2010, and wanted to give them ample time to react to this, uh, uh, to this new law, and in some cases potentially unwind what they might have received from an estate uh, through a, an inheritance last year. Now, this, this technique one would use to undo a transfer is what's called a disclaimer, and we've certainly talked about this in other uh, situations, uh, other, other presentations uh, in, in years past. Now, a disclaimer is a legal concept where the recipient of, of an inheritance, let's say, can declare that he or she doesn't want it. I don't want that inheritance. And if they do make that election, they're treated under the law as if he or she has actually predeceased the person who left, the person who died and actually left them the inheritance. So it's a legal fiction. I don't want it, therefore I'm treated as if I had died before the person who left me the asset. Now, it's a way for the person who doesn't want an asset to say, treat me as if I'm dead and figure out who would get that asset if I were dead, if I were really dead. So it can actually move assets to other beneficiaries of an estate uh, for 2010. So Congress provided this extra period of time up through September of this year. Normally there's a nine month window of time within which to make this election, this so-called disclaimer election, we now have that extended through September 19th for beneficiaries of estates from last year, which um, uh, actually may present certain opportunities in, in specific cases. So in summary, for 2010, talking about the last year now, the estate tax is reinstated unless an executor of, of, of a 2010 estate opts out. Now for this year and next year, what about the estate tax? The estate tax this year and next, the exemption against that is $5 million, and the top rate of tax, marginal rate of tax, is 35%. Effectively, we've got a 35% tax rate on estates greater than $5 million. The estate exemption, again, is indexed for inflation, so it may creep up some from $5 million to a higher number beginning in 2012, using 2010 as our benchmark year for that. So the gift tax exemption for 2010, as I said, was unchanged 
last year remained at a million dollars with a 35 percent gift tax rate. However, for this year and next, the gift tax has been reunified with the estate tax. So we have for gift tax purposes an exemption for this year and next of $5 million with a top rate of tax at 35 percent. Quite an improvement on where we expected to be with an expiration of the law at the end of, of 2010. And if you recall, the, the, the high water mark under the prior law was three and a half million. So it's, it's, it was quite the, the gift by Congress uh, at five million dollars. Now, one of the most interesting and complex features of this new law is a concept that allows a surviving spouse to inherit, if you will, any unused estate tax exemption from a predeceased spouse. So this applies only for people who die this year and next year. And mechanically, right, and mechanically it requires that the executor of the estate of the first spouse to die make an election on an estate tax return that's timely filed to transfer any unused estate tax exemption to the surviving spouse. This is what the concept of portability is, that we refer to as portability. So since the estate and the gift tax has been, have been reunified for this year and for next, this portability applies both for the gift tax exemption as well as the estate tax exemption of the surviving spouse. It does not apply for generation skipping transfer exemption, that third category of transfer tax, only for gift and estate tax. So let me give you an example of this just to make sure you, you, you understand how this works. Let's say a husband dies in 2011 with a $2 million estate survived by a wife. The husband's will, let's say, includes a formula <coughs> where the maximum amount that can be left to a trust without estate tax would go into a trust called the Credit Shelter Trust. And our documents will refer to this commonly as a family trust. Well, as I've already said, in 2011, this maximum amount is $5 million. Husband's estate, $2 million. So $2 million goes into the, in my example, goes into the Credit Shelter Trust. Simple math, $5 million was available, $2 million was used, $3 million remains. So what can happen is a, the husband's estate's executor can file an estate tax return, make an election to allow the surviving wife to inherit, if, again, if you will, this notion of inheriting the unused estate exemption, $3 million, of the, first, of the husband that, uh, uh, that died first. So now the wife has five plus three, $8 million of estate tax exemption that she can use, either through making gifts for th through her lifetime or to apply against her estate at the time of death. One other quick example that this would apply to, and, and probably the primary reason why this made its way into the law, which is a good thing. Let's say the husband had a, what we refer to as an I love you will. I'm sure everyone has heard that term before. Honey, I love you. I leave you everything I own outright. Well, in that case, same example, husband had $2 million, didn't create this complicated credit shelter trust formula in the will, just said everything goes to my wife, $2, uh, $2 million of assets passed through the husband's estate to the wife, and she uh, receives those $2 million in assets. What, is husband's state, what did husband's estate use as far as the estate tax exemption in that example? Zero, none of the exemption. Everything went to a surviving spouse which is, uh, uh, qualifies for the unlimited marital deduction, so there's no estate tax exemption used. The husband's estate still has the full $5 million of exemption remaining. This is exactly, exactly the situation we have worked hard to help our clients plan around in, in, in the past because we're wasting the exemption in the traditional tax uh, history uh, t uh, of, of this law. Well, in this case, with portability, if an election were made, the wife can actually take the full $5 million from the husband's estate and add it to her estate 
and gift tax exemption. She's got $10 million of exemption available for her to use before the end of 2012. <laughs> now, why did I write dangerous up there? Let, let, let me just uh, give you a little bit of, of, of input on that. One thing that, that, that I fear is that, that this idea of portability as it starts to make its way through the, the information channels out there and people start to learn about it, I think it's going to put many people on the sidelines because they're going to feel like they don't need to be dealing with their estate planning at all. They feel like they've, they have no tax problem whatsoever. <coughs> they have the opportunity for $10 million of, of estate tax exemption with doing no planning at all. Clearly, that's going to cover the, the, you know, virtually the entire population uh, in, in, in the country. So the, I, I fear it's going to just keep people on the sidelines. Plus, as I've already alluded to a couple of times, there's no certainty that portability is going to be extended beyond next year. So the only surefire way to take advantage of this wonderful concept is for both spouses to die in 2011 and 2012. <laughs> now, an interesting little thought is could portability, if it were in there long term, could it actually affect decisions on marriage and divorce? That I, and, and as I uh, explain that a little bit uh, more closely, you might understand what I'm talking about there because um, you only get the exemption of the last spouse to die before you. So if a spouse remarries after having received, in my example, $5 million of exemption, but it, if, say, wife remarried uh, a wealthy individual who, um, who, who died uh, before she did, second marriage died, seven bad luck, the husband died again before she did, <laughs> he has no exemption remaining. He used it up through lifetime giving or putting a, 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 a assets in a credit shelter trust. She now has zero uh, uh, portability uh, from either of the uh, predeceasing husbands. She only has her own exemption remaining. So it actually can affect the decision, in theory, to marry or to, um, uh, to divorce. Um, so let's talk about what are the positives of portability. Well, it sure is simple in concept for most of us to understand don't even need to have a will to take advantage of portability. It eliminates the need to retitle assets. One of the biggest pains to deal with as part of an estate planning exercise is making sure traditionally assets are owned properly between spouses. Well, portability could um, eliminate that, that uh, requirement, which again is part of the, the impetus behind this aspect of the law. Finally, the amount ported to the surviving spouse ultimately could allow more, more assets in the surviving spouse's estate to receive a step up in basis at the time a uh, surviving spouse dies, which could certainly help if, if assets appreciated during the period of time between the first spouse's death and the second spouse's death. But there are also some compelling reasons to not overthink this too much and to actually continue with some of the traditional <coughs> estate planning we've been doing involving credit shelter trusts. And let's start with what are the non-tax benefits to be continuing to think about your traditional credit shelter trust, what we call the family trust in our documents. First, the credit shelter trust provides asset protection for the surviving spouse. Contrast that with receiving an inheritance outright and all the assets are now part of the individual's estate. Asset protection against lawsuits, uh, against financial problems, for uh, bankruptcy. Uh, creditors and, and those that prey on the elderly. Those things can be uh, better protected against by leaving assets in trust versus outright to an individual. Also, a trust would allow the first spouse to die to have some ability to control and define how is that trust, how are these assets to be used for my surviving spouse uh, uh, for, her, for her or his lifetime. Uh, and again, if all assets are left outright, those issues would not be addressed uh, effectively. There are also some pretty significant tax benefits that are not going to be understood on the surface level, but as we in our uh, uh, business think about the, the impact of portability, uh, these are the things that, that come to mind. First, the deceased spouse's unused exemption amount is not indexed for inflation. 
So the five million example, uh, if the first spouse died, five million dollars left uh, of uh, unused exemption is left to the surviving spouse. The surviving spouse lives for another 30 years. If portability were still in the law at the time the, the second spouse dies, the exemption from the first spouse is, spouse is still a, fi a fixed five million dollars, notwithstanding what inflation has done over the, of the uh, period of time that uh, had elapsed. The first spouse to die, the unused exemption will be lost, as I've mentioned, if the surviving spouse remarries and survives his or her next spouse. Appreciation in, of assets left to the surviving spouse uh, outright is included in the estate of the surviving spouse, where those assets, if they're left in a credit shelter trust, would not be included in the estate of a surviving spouse. So we've got highly appreciating uh, assets that are owned by the first spouse to die. If they were left outright to the surviving spouse, those assets, although they might be portability of exemption, the assets that are growing rapidly might outpace the, the, the exemption that's ported over there and ultimately be subject to a state tax at the second death. Um, there is no portability of the deceased spouse unused generation skipping exemption. I mentioned it applies only for gift and estates, uh, estate tax purposes. What if the, what the family wants to do, the, the married couple wants to do, is to leave as much wealth as they can to the children and then to the grandchildren and then to the great-grandchildren? Well, they're not optimizing that if they're, they're just allowing assets to pass outright to the surviving spouse without using a trust where generation-skipping exemption can be, can be allocated to it, which is ordinarily uh, how we handle the credit shelter trust in, a, in an estate. Now, speaking of generation skipping exemption, let me just quickly review for you the generation skipping exemption changes to the law. For 2010, the generation skipping exemption was, like the estate tax, reinstated. There was previously no generation skipping transfer tax this year up through December 16th. December 17th, bang, generation skipping transfer tax applies again, which could have really affected a very small sliver of very wealthy individuals who would have been been um, uh, uh, making uh, large transfers to, to grandchildren or great-grandchildren last year. So because of that, that potential for a small sliver of, of people to be adversely affected by that, what Congress did is they say, well, we're going to apply the generation skipping transfer tax next year for fi uh, 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 transfers greater than $5 million, but if you make a transfer greater than $5 million, there's a 0% tax. So effectively, it didn't, it didn't harm um, any large uh, transfers last year that went to, to um, what we call skip people, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, that type. For 2012 and, uh, 2011 and 2012, the generation skipping exemption is, is also like the estate and gift tax at $5 million and a top marginal rate here again of 35%. Again, portability though doesn't apply to generation skipping transfer exemption. All right, so let's quickly review what I've covered thus far before we move into the last phase of, of, of the presentation. So here's a snapshot, snapshot of the estate gift and generation skipping transfer tax exemptions and rates for 2011-2012. Remember again, there's a lot of 5 million 2011, uh, 5 million 2012. There's a little asterisk next, next to the 2012 because that could be adjusted for inflation in all three cases. And then in 2013, absent further action, we're falling back down to a million across the board with a generation skipping exemption with an adjustment for inflation there back to $1998. It just happens to be a quirk in the 97 tax law that had that, uh, that inflation adjustment. And then the 55% top marginal tax rate for gifts, estates, and generation skipping transfers after 2012. The five things you need to do under this new law. First, review and update your estate plan documents as necessary. Every individual with a net worth in excess of $1 million would be well advised to review current estate plan documents in light of the changes. Take a look at whether the, whether the way the, the documents allocate assets as, as per formula clauses in the documents, do they continue to make sense in light of the much higher exemptions that are available for the next couple of years? If 
you have a family friend, a client that lives in a state other than Georgia where there is an independent state death tax, Connecticut, New York, a couple of examples of that. Um, if, uh, you need to review, again, the documents because if um, uh, you don't carefully plan that estate, there might not be a federal tax because of the large exemptions at $5 million. There could very well be a sta state death tax because I'm not aware of any one of those states who have, have tied into this new $5 million exemption level. They're typically going to be in the million dollar range or less at the state de tax uh, exemption level. So there could very well be a state death tax on the difference between that exemption at the state level and the $5 million that would that would go to, um, uh, to parties under the plan. Are the fiduciaries that were, that were uh, dis, uh, selected, the trustees, executors, are they sophisticated enough to be dealing with what could be much larger trusts at a $5 million level or the decisions on whether or not to uh, and how to elect for portability? Uh, these are some pretty sophisticated decisions that have to be made within a short period of time. Are the choices around fiduciaries appropriate under, or under current documents? Does the plan continue to meet non-tax related objectives uh, such as protecting the inheritance from a beneficiary's creditors, divorce potential of a beneficiary, financial predators, and, and that type of thing? Again, with higher exemptions, if assets are going outright to individuals, um, we might have exposure to those types of claims. Uh, estate planning documents um, uh, potentially we think ought to be revised to provide executors with clear guidance on how to deal with portability. Should the executor um, make this decision to file a tax return which has in it uh, you know, expense associated with it, you may not have to file an estate tax return because the estate's below the $5 million level, yet to get portability you have to file an estate tax return on, on the other hand. So it's going to put executors in an, uh, an odd position where they have to make a decision. Do I cause the estate to spend the money on an estate tax return to apply for portability where I don't know if this spouse is ever going to need to have portability or whether portability is going to last beyond 2012 for that matter. And then uh, ultimately decision is, uh, what you need to look at is, is your plan flexible enough to address what we have for the next two years and then the unknown we have after the next two years, which is a mantra we've been discussing uh, with these types of presentations here with, with our friends and clients over the last several years. Number two, um, for 2010 estates, decide whether to opt out of the estate tax. If you have a client or you know someone who last year uh, is dealing with an estate, somebody died last year, that there's an opportunity to consider whether or not to have the estate tax apply. Each case is going to have to be looked at individually because it's not just a simple uh, uh, estate tax or no estate tax decision. On the flip side, as, we, as, as I talked about with modified basis changes, you got to look at when will the capital gain ever be, uh, will it be incurred, when will it be occur, uh, incurred. Um, there are other um, um, issues regarding uh, the type of, of income that would be realized at the time of sale, all kinds of considerations. But in general, if the estate is below $5 million for last year, um, there's not going to be a benefit to opting out of the, uh, of the estate tax. Between $5 and $30 million in that range, uh, estate tax uh, costs are going to have to go through a very, you're going to have to be a very deliberate analysis of whether it makes sense to opt out or not. Um, in all instances, we would advise executors who's, in, who's involved with these 2010 estates, document your decision making for the file so that you have got uh, something uh, uh, that protects you with a claim by one beneficiary or another that you made the wrong decision. Um, and by the way, we have no official guidance on what exactly must be filed and when that has to be filed in order for an, uh, uh, an estate to opt out of the estate tax at this point in time. We think we know how it's going to happen, but right now we don't have official word from the IRS on that. Number three, for 2010 estates, determine whether a disclaimer can be helpful to shift wealth to grandchildren or younger generations. I think this is the primary area where, dis area where a disclaimer can be helpful um, for last year where you might have a situation where children received an inheritance, children may have their own uh, wealth, their own, they might be financially secure themselves and are in a position to say, uh, well, I don't need that, let it pass to my children or the grandchildren of the, of the, uh, the person who died. 
there's an opportunity with a disclaimer to make those shifts occur without any tax consequence and at a 0% generation skipping transfer tax rate. So there might be some limited circumstances where that applies, but I wanted to make sure that if there was a situation somebody here in the room knew about, there's a, an action that needs to be taken within the next um, uh, several months. Uh, and um, disclaimers are tricky. They require uh, that the person who is looking to make a disclaimer not have accepted any benefits at all from what they're saying they're going to disclaim. So they need to be informed about this early. And it may be too late in some cases. Okay, for 2011 and 2012 estates with a surviving spouse, uh, executor should make a timely election for portability. This might require, as I said, a, pr uh, a probate perhaps, where there would not have otherwise have been the requirement for a probate. This might require the filing of an estate tax return where there might not otherwise have been a, uh, an estate tax return required because the estate values is, is low, below the threshold. But nevertheless, you never know if portability A is going to be extended and B is going to be needed. It's possible a surviving spouse is, is, you know, may win the lottery, is, is the example, and would have um, uh, benefited the family would have benefited tremendously from that exemption of the first spouse uh, to the tune of millions of dollars. So not electing portability seems to be a, um, a bad fin a financial decision, but to elect portability does require some, uh, some effort and some expense because it has to be done on an estate tax return by an executor. Finally, the fifth thing is to uh, consider if you're in a position to do this, strategic gifting during the next two years. Some are already calling the next two years the greatest lifetime wealth transfer opportunity in American history based on the way this tax law um, is, uh, is written. So there's a compelling opportunity for wealthy individuals to make gifts using the $5 million gift and generation skipping tax exemptions. Remember, the law expires in two years or 23 months from now but if you made a gift this year or next year, you have the exemption still available to apply against that gift. Spouses can use split gifting, this concept of splitting gifts, to use a full $10 million in exemption. I know these numbers are, are just astronomical, but there could be limited circumstances where that type of wealth is involved, and this is an opportunity to, uh, uh, to take advantage of. So a, if, if all the assets are with one particular spouse, that spouse, by this notion of splitting gifts, can make a transfer of up to $10 million over the next two years with no gift tax. A surviving spouse may be in a position, in, in addition to that, to use the un, uh, unused uh, exemption that she might have received from a deceased spouse. Again, portability. So if someone dies this year leaving uh, all of the exemption to a surviving spouse, now the surviving spouse has $5 million of exemption from the first spouse to die, plus her own $5 million, there's 10. Let's say she remarries again, she's got another five. It could, potentially you can get 10 to $15 million in theory uh, available for gifts in the next three, two years. Uh, one would many would argue that the gift tax rate is not going to be any, any lower than the 35% rate level we have here in the next two years. So um, uh, there's also an opportunity in some cases to think about making taxable gifts and actually paying gift tax. And I'm going to go go past that quickly. It, it occurs uh, th there's a, uh, a limited opportunity for that as well. Triple play benefits of making a lifetime gift: the gifted assets removed from the estate, the Post-gift appreciation is also removed from the estate, and it's also possible to design a gift where the income tax generated on, a, on, on gifted assets after the gift also can be removed from the estate of the donor. That's why a gift can be very powerful. If the transfer assets can be discounted for various reasons, it's a gift in a closely held business, or uh, it is a fractional interest in some kind of property, real estate, for example, uh, that could reduce even further the value of something given away under these very large exemptions. So you can really push more assets out over the next two years than uh, any time uh, perhaps in, in prior history. And the law did not eliminate family limited partnerships, although there's a lot of discussion around that over the last few years. Uh, limited uh, uh, discounting uh, entities, limited partnerships, limited liability companies are all still viable and um, uh, are, should be considered in, in, in individual circumstances. Finally, the opportunity to make a gift, you are 
locking in the value of what you give away at the time of the gift. So if it happens to be a point in time where the particular asset is at a lower value, and over time it's anticipated that it will grow, the gift is made uh, at the time, the value is at the time of the gift, and um, uh, ultimately if the, the, the asset is worth many times more at the time of death, so long as the statute of limitations have expired, the IRS can't come back and, and challenge that gift value. Many would argue that the, uh, as I said, the gift tax rate will never be lower than 35 percent, so paying taxes could make sense in some cases. One warning about this idea of large gifts that, that um, uh, I've been discussing, there's this concept of recapture under the law, and what this is about is the way in which a state tax is calculated. If large gifts are made in the next two years at a $5 million exemption level and Congress doesn't get their act together and everything falls back to a million dollars after uh, 2012, the way in which the estate tax is calculated, you actually throw back in the estate for tax calculation purposes all of the gifts made during lifetime. So if you think about that, there might only be a million dollars of estate tax exemption, but when you're calculating the estate tax, technically you throw in the value of all the gifts during lifetime so you have a, a, a larger amount in theory in the estate than actually is there, and you might owe more tax than there are assets in the estate. It's possible that that would happen. Um, most people that, that are talking about that are geeks, you saw my picture, are geeks like uh, myself and George and Jeff and Janet and we're um, uh, uh, saying that they'll probably do something to remedy this anomaly but that is a risk that needs to be considered with making large gifts. Okay, to get everybody out of here within a reasonable time period I'm going to go quickly through uh, this uh, last couple of uh, uh, ideas around gifting. Uh, Talking about gifts, making large gifts. Well, how do you make those gifts? Of course, th those gifts can be made outright. And um, uh, the outright gift has got the, uh, the appeal of simplicity. But it also can go back to that, that, that idea that the assets are exposed to all kinds of, of, of creditor problems and, and uh, potential for poor money management or, or immaturity issues, self-destructive behaviors, et cetera, et cetera. Trust planning can protect against those, those risks. Uh, transfers to irrevocable trusts can, um, uh, can be done in a variety of ways and accomplish some of these features of protection and management and control that I keep referring to. One type of trust idea to think about is what, what we'll call a spousal access trust. So the, the concept might be, just in, in simplicity, might be one spouse takes $5 million worth of assets, puts it in an irrevocable trust for the benefit of the other spouse, children, grandchildren, the family. Um, when set up the right way, the trust is able to be protected against creditor claims of both spouses, um, not part of the estate of either spouse. Um, the, uh, the donor can actually, it can be set up where the donor can actually pay the gift, the, the income taxes on the trust over time. And um, uh, that can effectively take assets out of the taxable estate bucket, put it in another bucket that is available to the spouse and indirectly to the spouse who made the transfer, yet follow all the rules and have those assets outside of the estate for estate tax purposes while taking advantage of this limited window of opportunity to get that $5 million potential exemption amount. I'm using five as an example. It can be obviously something much less than that. Uh, if you think about exemptions falling back down to a million again, anything more than a million here could be um, a, a, an effective uh, way to take advantage of this, this law. Uh, another type of trust that many of you are familiar with is using uh, an irrevocable life insurance trust. Uh, one thing we've been thinking about is using that large estate tax exemption uh, amount of five, or gift tax exemption amount of five million, putting a large transfer into an irrevocable trust and having that trust assuming the family can afford all this, having that trust buy a very substantial life insurance policy with, with that, that, those funds, essentially creating a multiple time inheritance number for the benefit of the, uh, the spouse and children that can be uh, estate tax free uh, as well, taking advantage of, the, uh, of the, the typical benefit of a life insurance trust, which is what's in the trust is, is uh, outside the estate for tax purposes. And just a quick view of what that looks like. So the 
grantor might, um, uh, the, the, the creator of the trust might put in a large lump sum, let's say $2 million into the life insurance trust, buy a super huge life insurance policy with the $2 million, and then um, at the time of death, you've got a $30 million death benefit, let's say, that's outside of the estate for estate tax purposes, uh, generation skipping free, so it can ultimately go to grandchildren and, 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 and beyond, all of that with no current gift uh, or future estate or generation skipping tax consequence. And the last example is what we call an intentional grantor trust. And the, uh, the, the idea here is that uh, an irrevocable trust uh, where, where the income on the trust is actually reported to the creator of the trust so that any income taxes generated on the trust investments over the years ahead are, um, are the responsibility of the person who created the trust, which allows that trust to grow and accumulate uh, without any income tax depletion. So that's just another type of trust one might use, uh, and it can be leveraged up even further with a, uh, a private sale of assets to that type of trust uh, for um, uh, for a very low interest bearing promissory note. So that is in a nutshell uh, just a few examples of how you might make gifts and I want to get you all out of here on time. <laughs> so we are open for questions if you have any time to give us remaining. Thank you very much for your attention. I want to echo George's sentiments. Wonderful, wonderful opportunity to speak to all of you today. Thank you.